You have truth, you can have the good feelings after that and God's right. blessing. Amen. But to have no truth, but to always feel good, then your feeling's going to be a lie. See. Right. So as we cover uh, Wednesday night teachings, I always encourage anybody here. And I also want to tell, uh, I want to stress this to my people is, look, uh, don't just uh, agree. Come on. If there's something that uh, you don't know about, you got to ask. Amen. All right. Uh, it's important that you grow independently yourself rather than depending on a pastor. And that's why when he gets absent, you guys get more spiritually weaker. OK, it's very important you grow yourselves. All right, I'm not going to last forever. Even me, I couldn't depend on someone. That's why I became a pastor and helped you out. All right, but if I always depended on someone, I wouldn't minister to you. So you all have to do the same thing as well, okay? It's very important that you grow in knowledge yourselves. And that way you don't fall prey into the system of this world, okay? All right, I'm very happy to continue our history lesson, okay? So uh, let's uh, wrap up some things in our history here. First of all, let's uh, cover some portions in the Word of God. That way we can understand the spiritual warfare. I want you to go to, first of all, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6, and then the other place is Daniel 11. I want you to go to Daniel 11. I think it might be Daniel 8 instead, so let me look at it quickly here. We're going to go to, first of all, Ephesians chapter 6. And then the next one we're going to go is, I believe, Daniel 11. It'll be Daniel 11. If I'm wrong, then uh, I'm wrong, and I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. We're going to look at Ephesians 6. Now, the Bible shows that in the Christian life, it is important to understand, especially history, there is one common string that's tied to the beginning of history, ever since we started our world history class all the way to the end. There's one string that's tied to it, and nearly a lot of other uh, stories will have this. Without this, then it's not an uh, interesting movie or an interesting story. It's always a conflict. There's always a conflict. Uh, a battle of good versus evil. The main character has to overcome something overcome impossible odds and scenarios. So that's what usually makes a good story. Now, we are living in his story, history, and it's actually a true story. And if you've seen this common thread, you've seen the battle of good versus evil, how Satan developed his kingdom, the world's kingdom resulted from that, how uh, God's kingdom grew, switched from the Jews and then eventually to the Christian church. So... Remember this, just because that there are revivals, just because there is so much fruit that the Lord blessed our church, Amen. You don't, it doesn't eradicate evil. It doesn't eradicate suffering or conflict. It will happen. That has always been the thread and tie. Now, we studied the Great Awakening revivals. That's where we left off. Man, that was a big blessing. There is no doubt America started as literally a Christian nation as biblical principles. Now, the First Amendment and everything about religious freedom, it comes into play because it didn't come from any other religion, and it didn't even come from any other Christian denomination except a Baptist denomination, which explains why we stick to Baptists. Amen. Now, the Baptists today have fallen apart. Uh, that's why we're independent Baptists. But that's another part of our history that I'll tell you, okay? But anyways, continuing on, this is born... The country of America is born from Baptist distinctives. While that's going and revival spreading and the country is becoming prosperous, it's paving a way for the American Revolution eventually. And at the same time, don't forget evil. Where's evil all that time? Where's Satan all that time? He's not just going to let things fly freely and get souls saved and revived. He has to work underground and do something. So Ephesians chapter 6 the Bible says in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, 
against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's important to understand that in the Christian life, we war. <coughs> and the things that we war against is not physical, it's spiritual. When spiritual darkness is behind the scenes, then the physical worldly enemies we face in life become actually more real. It's not like Alexander the Great's empire versus against the Roman Empire. And that's just physical worldly enemies, right? They're fighting each other when they're both belong to the same spiritual master, Satan. But when we see the Roman Empire as our physical worldly enemy, so to speak, it's because we're seeing the spiritual, the actual evil behind the scenes, which is more spiritual than physical. That's the devil. And you've seen that. The Roman Empire has been the enemy of Bible-believing Christianity ever since the beginning of the church age and will continue to do so until the tribulation. Amen. That's the, one of the biggest enemy players in our world history is the pagan power of Rome. But it comes from Babylon itself a long time Amen. ago. And it all comes from Genesis 3. So that's where the roots of it lie. Now, notice it right here that if the spiritual darkness, if uh, the devils are our real enemy, then notice right here what's in line with the spiritual wickedness in high places, the devils. Notice it mentions principalities and powers. That refers to worldly kingdoms. Yeah. So there are worldly rulers. There has to be even today. Yeah. Government officials that will be part of the devil's system. Now look at Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. If there's going to be uh, darkness behind the scenes within the worldly kingdoms and governments, what made the governments evil? A lot of it you'll see is not really by public doing. It doesn't start that way. Public uprisings and public doings, public events in our world history change. The government's true. But you won't get the public event. You won't get the public stirred or the public to have an uprising unless there's something private, something hidden, something secret behind the scenes that stirs them up. An instigator. And the Bible warns that in the tribulation, there has been already something like that in place by the Antichrist. Notice right here in verse 30 that the Antichrist, he has something here within his worldly kingdom. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have what? Intelligence, Intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. Now notice right here that he has an intelligence group. He has an intelligent agency, so to speak. Now, we would call those things intelligent, uh, intelligence or intelligent agencies today, but it doesn't change the fact what the basic uh, meaning is the same. It's a group of people that has intelligence. Okay, now in our history, we cover that. There's a secret ploy and in intelligence going underground. Now, if you know so far in our history, who would be the intelligence, who would be the intelligence agency during that time that we can, yes, the Jesuits, right? The Jesuits are what we know so far, okay? It's interesting that a lot of other intelligence agencies that we uh, gain today, that a lot of it is, the, it's similar tactics as the Jesuits, very interesting. So it makes you wonder if they all come from the same master. Come on. And if not a physical master, definitely the same spiritual master. So we come to the beginning parts and show you about all this. But let's continue on with the Great Awakening revivals and then see what Satan does to attack it. As we continue on the Great Awakening revivals, we left off at uh, George Whitfield. Praise the Lord, George Whitfield and John Wesley, those were the two big guys that shook everything up and that changed America. America, you might recall, was falling into apostasy and was losing its biblical roots. The Baptists were the one holding on, but 
the whole country was falling apart. John Wesley and George Whitfield basically revived the spiritual awakenings where the Baptists kept holding the fort. So then the Lord used uh, an Anglican renegade and a totally different denomination, a Methodist, which is amazing. Uh, the Baptists were the one holding the fort and then the Anglican church uh, with the Puritans and that Calvinist roots was just perverting and uh, uh, corrupting everything. So then the Lord had to start out a brand new denomination, Wesley, and then uh, and, uh, kick the Anglicans in the rear end with an Anglican himself. So left off where the Baptists left off. And like I told you before, Whitfield realized that the Baptists were the ones that kept the, uh, that kept the spiritual thing going. As a matter of fact, even after Whitfield's death, Whitfield prophesied about a spiritual awakening or a dream or a hope that will happen one day in the South. And you know who picked it off? It was a Baptist. Truly, you cannot separate Baptist heritage or Baptist distinctives within the good guys of world history. You cannot do that no matter what. You'll see it all over. If you recall, the South which is known as the Bible Belt for a good reason. But believe it or not, during that time, as I told you before, it was apostate. It wasn't known as the Bible Belt. As a matter of fact, George Whitfield preached over there and he didn't get much fruit. And so because of that, he put a curse on one town and shook the dust off of his shoes and said that this town will not grow. And as a matter of fact, it didn't grow. Civilization got lost. So I believe if you go over there today, there's not much to see even. So in the South, there was no fruit and George Whitfield had a heavy burden. He mentioned this, which is very interesting. And everything that I've talked about so far is from uh, William Grady's book, How Satan Turned America Against God. This is found on page 133. Grady writes, although Philadelphia was noted for its Quaker-inspired religious diversity, Whitfield pointed to a Baptist preacher as the city's true spiritual leader. The Anglican evangelist acknowledged, I went and heard Mr. Jones, a Baptist minister who preached the truth as it is in Jesus. He is the only preacher that I know of in Philadelphia who speaks feelingly and with authority. The poor people are much refreshed by him and I trust the Lord will bless him more and more. So you might recall that I, I believe I gave that quote last time. Now, Standing in the pine thickets of North Carolina, between Newborn Town and Trent River, Whitfield cried these words. And this is on page 135 of Grady's book. Oh, that the Lord would send forth some who, like John the Baptist. How about that? That's why Baptist writers get confused. And they think John the Baptist is their founder. No, okay. But it is amazing that uh, George Whitfield, that he used that term Baptist. God would send for some who, like John the Baptist, might preach and baptize in the wilderness. I believe they would flock to him from all the country round about. Well, I, uh, the denomination you can think of who would best qualify for that are the Baptists. What happened? Well, George Whitfield said this on page 136. An incredulous Whitfield could only exclaim, all my chickens have turned into ducks. In other words, what Whitfield meant by that was the seeds that he was planting where he didn't get much fruit, those uh, basically the, the chicks, that's what he meant to say. So then these chicks would grow and become mature and there would be spiritual growth from that. So, Grady writes, six years after that anointed prayer meeting in North Carolina, a Congregationalist from Tallinn, Connecticut, by the name of Shubal Stearns, was converted under a Whitfield sermon in Boston. After six years of preaching as a new light, Stearns was immersed by Reverend Waite Palmer on May 20th, 7, <coughs> 1751, at the Baptist Church in Stonington, Connecticut, and ordained a Baptist minister. Now, this is a name, if you're a redneck, if you're in the South, this is a name you don't want to forget. 
Shubal Stearns is what you should give gratitude to, otherwise you wouldn't have the Bible Belt today. Now, Shubal Stearns of pastoring is very, very interesting. He's not, this is the mistake, he is not like typical IFB pastors and Bible believers who want to be IFB ministers, where they just keep keeping everybody and building a big, massive kingdom. Shubal Stearns, how he spread revival, is that you'll find out that his local church was not that big, but because he kept sending out preachers, it spread all around the Southern Belt. Now, if there's one thing that we learned at PBI, or I learned at PBI, it's to send out people. Amen. People becoming missionaries and pastors. That's why they're not a big, massive kingdom. They don't keep all the people. They send them out. What I want from this church, yeah, I want everybody to come here and grow, but more so than that, I want to send them out. You know what my, uh, I don't know if I ever mentioned this to the church, but my burden is that we would have churches planted in this Bay Area, Bible-believing churches. I don't know if any of you have a burden to start a ministry or a mission, but this will be my desire one day. And then we can reach the whole world more effectively that way. One man cannot plant uh, two to three churches running by himself while traveling around the world ministering to other countries. Come on, that's right. We need lots of people. Yes, that's right, Pastor. Brady writes, four years later, following a brief ministry in Opecan, Virginia, Whitfield's John the Baptist arrived in the wilderness of North Carolina. He was two months shy of his 50th birthday. On November 22nd, 1755, seven devoted couples, including Shubal's brother-in-law, Reverend Daniel Marshall, another of Whitfield's ducks, joined Pastor and Mrs. Stearns in establishing the Sandy Creek Baptist Church in Guilford County, North Carolina. So notice that Whitfield's seeds are being planted with Stearns and then some of the people that started out the church and ministry. Uh, their first meeting house was a multi-million dollar auditorium measuring 26 feet by 30 feet as to Whitfield's prayer vision that the multitudes would flock to him from roundabout. We have this amazing account from Tidence Lane, a former enemy who was converted and called to preach under Stern's ministry. All right, check this out. Mr. Stern's was but a little man but a man of good natural parts and sound judgment. Amen. Of learning, he had but a small share, yet was pretty well acquainted with books. His voice was musical and strong, which he managed in such a manner as one wild to make soft impressions on the heart and fetch tears from the eyes in a mechanical way and anon to shake the very nerves and throw the animal system into tumults and perturbations. All the separate ministers copy after him, in tones of voice and actions of body, and some few exceed him. His character was indisputably good, both as a man, a Christian, and a preacher. In his eyes was something very penetrating. He seemed to have a meaning in every glance, of which I will give one example. And the rather, because it was given me by a man of good sense, I mean Titten Lane. <coughs> when the fame of Mr. Stern's preaching had reached the Atkin, where I lived, I felt a curiosity to go and hear him. Upon my arrival, I saw a venerable old man sitting under a peach tree with a book in his hand and the people gathering about him. He fixed his eyes upon me immediately, which made me feel in such a manner as I never had felt before. I turned to quit the place, but could not proceed far. I walked about, sometimes catching his eyes as I walked. My uneasiness increased and became intolerable. I went up to him, thinking that a salutation and shaking of hands would relieve me. But it happened otherwise. I began to think that he had an evil eye and ought to be shunned. But shunning him, I could no more affect than a bird can shun the rattlesnake when it fixes its eyes upon it. When he began to preach, my perturbations increased so that nature could no longer support them, and I sank to the ground. That's the power of God that he had. Wow. That's right. Grady writes, at a time when only seven Baptist churches existed south of the Mason-Dixon line, 
Vetter gives the number of local assemblies directly started by Sandy Creek at 42. That's, that's a big, that's big, man. From 7 to 42 and adds that 125 ministers were sent out over a 500 mile area. This statistic would appear to represent about 99% of the male mem membership. <laughs> Perhaps this is the way the congregation numbered only 16 at Schubel Stern's death in 1771. Do you realize that? This guy was so used to sending out people, he only had 16 in this church. That's good. Amen. He's not an IFB kingdom builder or these mega churches you see. He's the type that sends out people. Oh, that we would have more people like that. On this site, uh, so this is what the founder's grave is read as follows. On this site in November to December 1755, Reverend Schubel Stearns, his wife, and those who came with them, seven other families, 16 souls in all, built their first meeting house where they administered the Lord's Supper. It is a mother church, nay, a grandmother and a great-grandmother. All the separate Baptist spring hence, not only eastward toward the seed, but westward toward the great river Mississippi. He reached that far, guys. Remember, it was the original 13 colonies that time, but then he moved more uh, toward the western area. But northward to Virginia and southward to South Carolina and Georgia, the word went forth from this Zion, and great was the company of them who published it in so much that her converts were as drops of morning dew. That's what they wrote on their founder's grave. That was Schubel Stearns. That's how great, that's how the South became the Bible Belt, is because of that man. You got to realize this, Whitfield and Wesley, uh, Wesley's fruits did not last to this day compared to Schubel Stearns. Whitfield was one who had the mass congregation, but he didn't have a lasting ministry. Not even Wesley to today, but the South did. To this day, it still is. A, a lot of the majority of the best Bible-believing preachers you'll hear today yep. is actually South. Amen. Probably 90% of it is South. Amen. That's his fruit. That name should be remembered. All right, so the Baptist definitely had it made. And Great Awakening was spreading out. You got also David Brainerd. You also got Jonathan Edwards and many other people. Now, I also have to give this as a disclaimer. You, um, remember this. Calvinism has been the thorn on the side toward the Bible-believing movement, and they always been mingled. So George Whitfield, unfortunately, fell prey to Calvinism, which I mentioned to you before. However, you'll notice that his practice is not very Calvinist. It's more Baptist. David Brainerd, unfortunately, was, uh, was Calvinist as well as Jonathan Edwards. So a lot of these Calvinists, they'll boast about their Calvinist originals and then say, what have you got in your Baptist originals? Well, you already studied it from the beginning of world history. If we went by Calvinist as the beginning of our history, we'd be a cult. Do you realize that? Yeah, right. Named after John Calvin. And they boast themselves being Calvinist. Yeah. And they call me Ruckmanite. How funny. Hypocrites at their finest. You know what, uh, what our history is? The Bible. We're Bible believers. We go by Bible-believing distinctives. Our practice as a church today goes from the beginning of Jesus Christ, and I've shown you the Bible-believing distinctives in the beginning of our history, and you'll notice Baptist distinctives 90% of the time match up with those Bible-believing distinctives from the beginning of the century of the church. That's where we come from. We, we, uh, we only call ourselves Baptist because that's the best denomination that goes by the Bible-believing distinctive. Amen. If we're going to give ourselves technically a name, it would be Bible-believer then. Because we always go by always what the Bible said. And in the beginning of history, Calvinist, Lutheran, whatnot, you'll notice the fruit of the Bible-believer is those who followed the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. So even though Luther was Calvinist, what made him a part of our history? The beginning was he followed the Bible. That's how he got saved. And that's what broke apart the Ro Holy Roman Empire. Amen. We go by, in our history, people who followed the Bible and paved the way for that. Okay? Amen. Calvinists 
You're a cult. You go back to Augustine. You don't start from the beginning. You go from Augustine, who's mingled with Catholicism, jumbled up with Alexandrian manuscripts, as well as um, uh, Catholicism, Calvinism, post-millennial uh, post or amillennial, whatever. And then you go to Calvin. You start from Calvin. No, we go back to Jesus Christ. We go back to the Bible. Okay? Have a nice day. Move on. All right. Now, let's see the Baptists here. There's persecution in Virginia. So, uh, and the Baptists also suffered persecution in Massachusetts. Now, remember Massachusetts, that's where the art of everything started with the pilgrims. And then you notice that the Baptist heritage was starting. So then uh, Roger Williams, he got kicked out, went to Rhode Island, consequently. But there's persecution against the Baptists that time. William Grady writes about it on page 139, as well as page 141. Now, there's a lot of good stuff here about the persecution of Baptists, but I just don't have uh, time to read all of them right here. But it's just a lot of good stuff about the Baptist heritage. But I'll just summarize it as follows. To keep the way clear for others, Grady writes on page 140, dozens of Baptist preachers would have to hear the doors to their own cells clang somberly behind them. But then to everyone's surprise, a most unusual phenomenon occurred. The deprived congregation started going out to the gowls to hear their Sunday sermons. As a jail pastor would attempt to deliver his message through the prison window's iron gates, the incensed and embarrassed magistrates would do every imaginable thing to distract his humble flock. While some beat on drums, others were, would hurl snakes and hornet nests at the crowd. Still others tried to disperse the faithful by sending drunks on horseback into their midst. Now, mainly what they got in trouble, remember, was that church state. Remember that church state thing? Church state is a horrible thing. That's the reason why America was born, because no mingling with church and state. But you notice how today we're seeing the state more involved with church now. Back then it was church getting more involved with state. Now the devil just has to simply reverse it. It's that simple. But pretty soon you're going to have both of, uh, you're going to have both of them mingled together real soon. You can't separate that in, rebel, in the tribulation one day. It will combine. You'll notice other major religions, how they always think about church state. You notice that? Other major religions, they always mingle religion and then the politics, the government together. No, they're separated, man. They're separated. That's why we know we got the truth over here. People who boast themselves as truthers and stuff like that don't realize if they're lost that they have a lot to thank for the Bible believers and we're the ones that are right. All other denominations, Calvinists and whatnot, and other major religions have always mingled it. One example Grady gives is uh, Pastor John Weatherford of Chesterfield County. And he spent six months in the county gal for preaching without a license. However, his oppressors soon discovered that they had more on their hands than they had bargained for. So many locals started getting converted below the grates of Weatherford's cell. I mean, at the Baptist uh, pastor's cell, his prison cell. There were so many locals getting converted over there that the magistrate ordered a 12-foot wall be erected directly in front of the preacher's window. <laughs> However, they quickly learned to their chagrin that out of sight was not out of range. <laughs> when Weatherford's faithful congregation assembled for church, a handkerchief on a pole would be raised as a signal that they were re ready for the Sunday sermon. The man of God then proceeded to throw his voice through the grates over the 12-foot impediment. Such an unorthodox worship service was known back then as denying the prison bounds. Street preaching has always been a distinctive with Bible-believing history. All right, but there's a lot more. I can't read all of this. It's just such good stuff. Okay, let's move on in our history, or I'll stay stuck in the 1700s for many more weeks, okay? Maybe one day I'll do a very detailed thing about that, but I got to move on. We're doing world history, okay? So what now does this have to pave the way for the American Revolution, the Founding Fathers? 
you got to realize this. They've got the Baptist to thank for, the Baptist distinctive. If it wasn't for them, America would not have been born with its distinctives, actually. So the American Revolution and the Founding Fathers. I'm going to show you that Baptists were truly a big part of this. And notice that today, as the world goes, really, they target which denomination more than any other is Baptist, you'll notice. And as they target that, you notice how a world is falling apart? But when the world sides with the Baptists and then they get convicted and changed, you notice how God's blessing is on it? But anyway, here are some interesting things that uh, Grady said on page 142. As time went on, authorities in both sections of the country started seeing political egg on their faces. A Baptist in Massachusetts declared sardonically, the sons of liberty ought rather to be called sons of violence, end of quote. In Virginia, lawyers with household names such as Thomas Jefferson, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death, and James Madison began successfully representing various Baptist preachers in court. You know why? Because they weren't following the church state program. Because they were preaching without a license. So believe it or not, these founding fathers were, uh, were lawyers or defending them before they became presidents or they became famous for American history. William Cathcart relates that on one occasion, Henry, Patrick Henry, rode 50 miles to Fredericksburg to be present at the trial of John Walker, Lewis Craig, and James Childs, who were indicted for the crime of preaching the gospel contrary to the law, whose acquittal he speedily secured. With reference to six jailed Baptists in Culpeper, Virginia, Madison wrote to a friend, quote, that diabolical hell-conceived principle of persecution rages among some. See, they disagreed with that. They believed that was of the devil. Then on March 5th, 1770, the Lord got everyone's attention when five American citizens were killed by British muskets in the infamous Boston Massacre. For some of you know, that was one of the big things that started the American Revolution. Was it just another spiritual coincidence that their blood was shed only a few yards from the very spot where Obadiah Holmes was whipped unmercifully with 30 lashes? Do you remember Obadiah Holmes that shed the first blood? First Christian blood there? Man, what, that's interesting. According to what we learned in school, the next most significant event in America's quest for liberty was the Boston Tea Party on December 16, 1773. However, that affair pales in comparison to a rarely told incident provoked by a band of patriotic Baptists 18 months earlier. John Brown of Rhode Island, a brother of Nicholas Brown, of after whom Brown University was named. Now, did you notice I keep pointing out these Ivy League schools, these successful schools? They got a lot to owe to Christian heritage back then. Remember, Edwards was the one with Princeton. And even Berkeley got its name out of all things from George Berkeley, who said the most uh, holy quote ever. He also was a successful merchant and owner of 20 vessel. Dr. Cathcart writes, John Brown might be said to have begun the revolution himself, believe it or not. Thus we conclude that while some Boston Protestants disguised as Indians went down in history, went down in history for throwing a few crates of tea overboard, a band of freedom-loving Baptists from Rhode Island boldly blew up and sank the ship they had boarded. The ensuing war with Great Britain gave the Baptists a golden opportunity to display their true heroics and patriotism. Within weeks of the aggression at Lexington and Concord, the Rhode Island legislature voted to send 1,500 men to the conflict. The Baptist colony was also the first to sever formal ties with England, England doing so on May the 4th, 1776, a full month before Virginia. Even the enemy understood the Baptist contribution. British General William Howe confirmed, quote, the Baptists were among the most strenuous supporters of liberty 
end of quote. And to add insult to injury, Dr. John Rippon of London, in a letter written in 1784 to Dr. James Manning, president of Rhode Island College, which would be later known as Brown University, declared, quote, I believe all our Baptist ministers in town, except two, and most of our brethren in the country were on the side of the Americans in the late dispute. How about that? There's no doubt this American Revolution, why there's a lot of Baptist distinctives in it is because, remember, the, one of the Baptist distinctives, as I told you, is separation of church and state. Amen. It's known as the independence of the local church. The autonomy of the local church. Amen. That's the reason why uh, Baptists later separated from the, t uh, the, the big Baptist conventions today. Because the big Baptist conventions lost that distinctive. The importance of the autonomy of the local church. That's why we're independent. As our church, this is it. We don't, uh, we don't be bound by other churches' dictatorship. We have the freedom to do what we want as a church right here. No one runs this church. Amen. All right? That's how we do things. The only leader would be the pastor or the deacons, but that's it. We don't have some kind of head pastor with a head pastor, then a head bishop with a chief bishop, which goes to archbishop, then to cardinals, and then pope. That's how the Catholic Church was born. See? So we don't run that way. We don't run that way. Let's see right here. Much of the credit for the army's overall performance was due to the strong spiritual leadership provided by, believe it or not, Baptist chaplains. Yep. Believe it or not, though nearly 20 different religious denominations existed in 18th century colonial America, Baptist preachers filled a third of the 102 chaplain positions in the Continental Army. Because of their reputation for being able to pray and shoot, <laughs> bless him, Jesus, blam, etc., William Grady writes, the soldiers received a steady stream of manly spiritual inspiration. As a matter of fact, a lot of these chaplains would shoot, actually, and they were known for their shooting. So Elder M. McClen um, if I can pronounce this, McClanahan, Reverend David Barrow, and David Jones. These were all chaplains that were shooting as well, and they were Baptists. <laughs> Let's see right here. As a matter of fact, David Jones was highly respected by George Washington and preached to the suffering troops at Valley Forge. You remember that infamous winter? where the soldiers, I mean, when they take off their boots, sometimes a f part of their feet would come off with it. Valley Forge, they were starving. They could have lost. However, uh, the Baptist ministers were there all the way and ministered to them. With reference to Richard Furman, a Baptist pastor from South Carolina, for whom Furman University was named, for people who didn't know that, Lord Con Cornwallis was said to have remarked, so this is the British guy, that he what? Feared the prayers of that godly youth more than the armies of Sumter and Marion. <laughs> How about that? General Washington was well aware of the priceless contribution of these men, declaring, quote, Baptist chaplains were among the most prominent and useful in the army. That's what Washington stated, end of quote. In fact, John... Uh, I think his name, last name is pronounced as uh, Gano, so we'll put John Gano right here. John Gano is recognized as the most influential chaplain of the entire war. He possessed a large degree of the patriotic spirit of the Baptists of that place, a writer says. Now, the reason why John Gano is going to be uh, very important for your history is going to be as follows. It mentioned, uh, let's see right here. Uh, I'm trying to find that quote. Anyways, uh, John Gano, he was known to be uh, as, a, as a person 
who made a huge influence on uh, Washington's life. As a matter of fact, uh, oh, now I see right here. He, he was the one that crossed the river with uh, George Washington, that famous picture of him crossing the river. And as a matter of fact, uh, George Washington, when he was crossing over the river, he was, uh, giving a, he was talking about water baptism, actually, at the same time. So there is a lot of uh, Baptist uh, uh, respect, Baptist uh, admiration in Washington's side. There's no doubt about it. As a matter of fact, th the battle was very important because Grady writes, had Washington's army not prevailed at Yorktown, America would have remained a church state indefinitely. In fact, Isaac Bacchus explains the dilemma faced by the Church of England clergy in the colonies as, quote, there were many others e in England that held to a lineal succession of office who wanted to have power in America, but no bishop could be ordained in England without swearing to the king's supremacy. See, you notice how England is tied to church. So that's why the Baptist uh, distinctives were very important. James Beller elaborates as follows. The victory of the revolu revolution militarily and spiritually forged America into a Baptist nation. This was accomplished not by establishment, but by disestablishment. In breaking off our ties with our mother country, we broke the succession of their state church bishopric. Amen. You know what George Washington said? General Richard M. Gano, the great-grandson of John Gano, testified as follows. George Washington on one occasion said to Chaplain Gano, quote, I am convinced that immersion is the baptism taught Amen. in the scripture. Amen. And I demand baptism at your hands. So notice right here, George Washington, he got baptized by a Baptist minister. Now, those Freemasons later on, they tried to take advantage of Washington and say, no, he was one of us. No, actually, he was from Baptist distinctives. Amen. Believe it or not. How did the Masons get involved in that? So I'll tell you about the Masons getting involved in that later. All right. I'll tell you about the Masons getting involved in that later. So, but this is amazing. And as a matter of fact, there is a picture of George Washington getting baptized. Uh, by the Baptist minister as well. So you'll know, and then there's an explanation to why uh, Washington is not a Mason. So I'll explain all that probably a little later on, all right? But the point is, there's no doubt, America started as strong Baptist distinctives, not Masonry. Well, how did darkness settle in? How did they get in? Because if you look at Washington, D.C., there's no doubt you see Masonic architectures. There are some things you can see in the, uh, when they write the Declaration of Independence or the Bill of Rights or anything else, or, when they, or the quotes of some of these founding fa fathers, they're connected to some kind of Masonic ties and elements. So what in the world is going on? Why is that? Okay? Why is that? Why is there Masonry, some of that influence involved? Remember this as I read to you from the Word of God. As the Baptist paved the way for the birth of America, there has to be a thread of evil as well. Remember that. You cannot separate that from history. Satan will find that good thread and get in there. That's why he tried with Calvinism. You notice that? You notice that? That's why he got intermingled with the Bible-believing history. And that's why he'll go even lower than that, obviously. His ultimate goal is not Calvinism. Come on. Calvinism, wrong doctrine, is the starting point to his ultimate darkness, which is to rule the whole world in lies and that they live in a lie. That's why it goes down the gutter to Freemasonry and then Roman Catholicism and then globalism and then uh, socialism, communism, and etc. It goes down that drain. Here are some interesting things about uh, the Baptists, believe it or not. The Baptists, they still suffered persecution even after the war. 
In fact, in May of 1782, a mob in Hingham, Massachusetts, broke into the house where a certain Reverend Lee was preaching to several brethren. The intruders were, quote, seized Mr. Lee by his left arm and his collar and twitched him away with great violence and others taking hold of him hauled Mr. Lee along clear out of town, cursing and swearing most terribly, and one of them cast soft cow dung in Mr. Lee's face. Then one Captain Theophilus Wilder, Wilder took a long club over Mr. Lee's head and swore that if he ever came into that town again, he would take him and tie him up and whip him 30 stripes. To which Lee replied in good pietistic style, that is not so much as a whipped Paul. That is not so much as they whipped the Apostle Paul, he said. You get that? That's something. You know what Samuel uh, Adams observed? Quote, the people seem to recognize this resolution as though it were a decree promulgated from heaven. End of quote. Now, that was the Declaration of Independence read by Colonel John North. And Grady writes about this. Having spoiled the founding fathers with this glorious document, the Lord of glory decided to withhold any further political enlightenment until such time as they would come to grips. So over the next six years, America floundered under the wisdom of the infamous Articles of Confederation. Now, you might recall during that time when after the American Revolution, as you can guess, they won and then they were able to break free from England's grasp. But when they started their government, uh, all schools, pretty much all schools of thought will agree that the first documents was a big mess. What's that again? The Lord's trying to humble them. The Lord's trying to get them to go back to Baptist distinctive again. If there's one thing you notice from history, men never learn from history. When the pilgrims land, then they go apostate. Then when the Baptists start to spread out, then they go apostate. Then there goes the Salem witch trials. Then goes the Great Awakening revivals, God sins and revival. Then they go apostate again. You notice that train that just never dies and end. And before you judge them harshly, look at your life and look at this church. Every time there's something that we do together and go up, then it's just you just go down again. Why? Keep it going up, man. Pastor Cam can't keep you up forever. You guys got to keep yourselves up, too. Attend every church meeting and every soul winning, street amen. preaching, amen. participating, teaching, preaching, amen the group and amen the preacher, the teacher. Encourage them, get involved in kitchen, do whatever. Amen. Don't amen. die out when the pastor dies out. Yeah. Learn from your history. That's why I like it. Full house in Wednesday service. That's how it should be. Yes, sir. Amen. Not five people. Amen. Patrick Henry, who's a, actually a devout Presbyterian, frequently went to court in what? The Baptist uh, defense. Semple wrote, quote, the Baptist found in Patrick Henry an unwavering friend, end of quote. As a matter of fact, Armitage relates how Jefferson was molded by Baptist polity. So this is what, how Jefferson was influenced by them. Quote, many historical writers have told us that he was in the habit of attending the business and other meetings of a Baptist church near his residence, that he closely scrutinized its internal democratic policy and its democratic relations to its sister churches, that he borrowed his conceptions of a free government, state and federal, from the simplicity of Baptist church independency and fraternity, and that frequently in conversation with his friends, ministers, and neighbors, he confessed his indebtedness, uh, his indebtedness to their radical principles for his fixed convictions on the true methods of civil and religious liberty. Did you hear that? He says we're indebted to these Baptists for his own fixed convictions on the true methods of civil and religious liberty. You got some truthers and politicians talking about, I want to go back to Thomas Jefferson's idea of government and stuff like that. Well, where are you attending church, buddy? You should thank us Baptists, man. Here's something by Lemuel Barnes. Adds this, quote, uh, As a boy, Thomas Jefferson, frequently visiting in the home of his mother's sister, Mrs. Woodson, went with his aunt and uncle to their church, a Soul Liberty Church, 
As a man, he was a close observer of such churches in his own neighborhood. As a preeminent citizen, he wrote, To the members of the Baptist Church of Buck Mountain, I thank you, my friends and neighbors. We have acted together from the origin to the end of a memorable revolution. Tradition insists that he said that he acquired his clearest perceptions of democratic government from closely observing Baptist churches. It is rather more than tradition, for Mrs. James Madison said that she had a distinct recollection of conversations with him about it and that he was always declaring that it was a Baptist church from where these views were gathered. Wow. General Madison, a brother of James Madison, you know, who later uh, contributed to the American presidency and the American government, was a member of a church of that kind, Baptist. How about it? There's a lot to thank the Baptists, isn't it? The Baptists were definitely uh, a part of that. Now, to get to the other parts. Uh, oh, uh, I got to get my notes here. How did... Freemasonry get involved. Yeah. Where are the Jesu Jesuits all that time? If you know one thing about Rome, they just don't go silent for centuries. They're always busy doing something. Remember, they sent out their Catholic missions. However, the Lord counter, uh, counter attacked their own counter reformation. He had Moravian missionaries sent out, he had the Great Awakening revivals. As a matter of fact, the Great Awakening revivals, you'll see this ain't the first, this ain't the first and the last. Dr. Upman, I think, put about eight. They, uh, Christian historians mainly put two or just one. That continues all the way to what? Till the 1900s. Yep. That's something. That's something. But what is Rome doing all that time? Okay, so uh, it would be lame if I ended here, right? I'm sure you want to hear this, right? Okay, how about I read it then, okay? So I'll read as much as I can. And then I'll give the re remaining juicy parts in our next history lesson, okay? Amen. All right. Now, this is from uh, uh, Frederick Widdowson's book on page uh, 399 in his book, uh, 309, excuse me, 309. And the book title is A Bible Believer's Guide to World History. <clears throat> now, let's move on to activities purely in the sphere of religion in the 1700s. In the Catholic Church, the Society of Jesus known as the Jesuits, had become so involved worldwide. Uh, let me move over here. That way people can see the other side of the picture. In the political affairs of nations, as well as in the economic affairs, they were actually expelled from many countries for, them, for their meddling. As a matter of fact, even the Vatican itself kicked out the Jesuits. So I indicated that a few times, but... It's official now that I'm reading, okay? In 1773, Pope Clement XIV wrote a brief of dissolution. The Orders General, Father Ricci, was even imprisoned and died in confinement. Their intrusion in commerce and politics in many European countries had been disastrous for those countries with their negative influence going all the way to Japan and China. European un opinion, European opinion, was that when Clement died 14 months after signing the brief, it was by the hand of the Jesuits, who had become powerful with plantations operated by slaves, manufacturers, and a worldwide financial and political empire at stake. Ooh. Don't mess with them. <clears throat> Jesuit priests had become the confessors of many European kings princes, queens, and princesses, and had instigated wars, or at least had a hand in their initiation. However, they were reestablished in Europe by Pope Pius, Pius VII in 1814. One of their supporters called this reestablishment an act of counter-revolution. Nevertheless, they were finally expelled from even Russia by 1820. The society was virtually reborn, however, in the 19th century. All right. That's too fast, one by one, okay? What's going on here, okay? Jesuits, it's called the Jesuit Suppression. It's a famous timeline. 
almost probably two centuries maybe or over a century, I'm not sure. But they got kicked out by the Vatican. Rumors were spreading that the Pope got killed by the Jesuits themselves. And then the Jesuits, they just got kicked out by every country. Every ruler was talking bad about them. They were blaming the Jesuits for all the things. As a matter of fact, the American founding fathers, when they started their nation, they warned about Jesuit infiltration. They knew that. And at the same time, they warned about Masonic, who, fled, uh, who were the Illuminati that time. And no, that's not a conspiracy word. That's actually the real historical thing. The conspiracy part is today, obviously, that yeah. term. But the Illuminati is a real group from back then, okay, from Adam Weishaupt. That's a historical thing. You just don't study history. Look it up yourself. But the Illuminati members from Adam Weishaupt took the oath of Freemasonry, actually. So I will, this is a lot, okay, but I got to do this one by one, all right, so, and then explain to you how the whole story goes, okay? First of all, let's uh, cover the Jesuits and then the relationships with the Masons. If I'm fast, I can cover all. If not, I'll only cover half. Here we go. Louis XV from France, remember, that's probably the most powerful European empire that time, Okay. He warned this, quote, whereupon the investigation into the constitution and statutes of the society, which is the Jesuits, the Society of Jesuits, resulted in the enactment of a parli parliamentary decree, which shows the odium then attached to the society in France. It denounced their doctrine and practices as perverse, destructive of every principle of religion wow. and even of probity. So notice right here that the Baptist is really for that religious freedom thing. Jesuit is the total opposite. It's control. Even France admitted that. Come on, man. Even France admitted that. And France wasn't a good nation that time. As injurious to morality, pernicious to civil society, seditious, dangerous to rights of the persons of sovereigns, as fit to excite the greatest troubles in states. He's talking about uh, including the United States. To form and maintain the most profound corruption in the hearts of men, that the institutions of the Jesuits should forever cease to exist throughout the whole extent of the kingdom. So they got kicked out by France. Charles III of Spain. Kicked them out too. And now that's a die-hard Catholic country, if you recall, okay? They even kicked them out. Quote, his greatest work, the expulsion of the Jesuits, would never have been carried out if he had not been persuaded of its political necessity. The order had already been driven out by Cavalho, the Marquis of Pombal from Portugal, and, fra and by Choiseul from France. When Charles III was, convict was convinced that a riot in Madrid had been promoted by the Jesuits. Kicked out by Spain. Even the Knights of Malta, which is probably the second most powerful, Britain, you never heard of these groups, right? Yeah, of course, you don't study. They don't tell you this stuff. Do you even know the Knights of Malta? The, Knight, the, the Grand Master of the Knights of Malta. Knights of Malta, you'd be surprised. They're a powerful group. Probably second greatest power next to Jesuits. In the world's eyes, maybe the greatest po Catholic power, more than Jesuits. But the Grand Master of the Knights of Malta, Fra Manuel Pinto de Fonseca, was driven from the Isle of Malta in 1768. And we discover, a certain author wrote, in 1768, the Jesuits, having, having given much trouble, were expelled and their property confiscated. Even Knights of Malta admitted. In fact, the famous bull Dominus Ac Redemptor Noster, by which, he by which he dissolved and forever annihilated the order as a corporate body, end of quote, at a moment when it counted 22,000 members, the bull justifies itself by a long and formidable list of charges against the Jesuits. Had this accusation proceeded from a Protestant pen, it might have been regarded as not free from exaggeration, but coming from the papal chair, it must be accepted as a sober truth. Now the Vatican itself kicked them out. This is from James A. Wiley, 1878, Scottish Protestant historian in the history of Pro Protestantism, the Jesuits. Now here's a one from... Uh, 
let's see right here. El Elosium uh, Giustiniani, he's an Italian ex-Roman Catholic priest. So he wrote a work, Papal Rome as it is by a Roman. So this is what he wrote down. Their abolition was not a work of haste. According to the life of this pope published in the year 1776, he spent four years deliberately examining the history of this order. He searched the archives of the propaganda for the documents relating to their missions, the accusations against and apologies for them. Desirous of being correct in the matter of his condemnation, he communicated his brief privately to several cardinals and theologians as well as to some sovereigns, etc., so notice that the Pope didn't just kick them out by rumor. He went through careful examination, and he didn't want to kick them out. Before he promulgated it, which is the bull, he then decided on the abolition, the Jesuits, but not without considering the consequences to himself. The bull of restoration by Pius VII in the year 1814 was an unfortunate event for the Church of Rome, not only because it has restored the Jesuits, but because it gave a tremendous blow to the infallible authority of the Pope. It showed that the bull of Clement XIV, in which the, that pontiff suppressed and annulled the order of the Jesuits, was wrong. And how can we know that his bull of restoration was right? Popery boasts loudly of its uniformity of creed, unity of actions, and infallibility of authority. But it is not surprising to see the same authority in contradiction with itself. The house is divided and it must fall. Jesuits are so powerful that even the papal decree fell apart. You'll notice. Where did they, uh, where did they get expelled? Well, Rome, uh, Portugal, Fran 1759 kicked them out. France, 1764. Spain, 1767. And Austria, 1770. So you can give or take a couple of years, but research it yourself. But they sought refuge in Rome, and then Pope Clement XIV, 1773, kicked them out. So then where did the Jesuits go? They went to Russia. And as a matter of fact, this is all recorded by uh, Jesuit.org. Even their own website admits it. And the title of their article is Suppression and Restoration of Jesuits, Jesuits in Britain. This is very interesting. Jesuits in Italy had to renounce the Society of Jesus in order to remain in ministry. Some of those who refused found refuge in Catherine the Great's Russia. A fan of neither the Habsburg and Bourbon dynasties nor the Pope, Catherine put many Jesuits to work in extending their education system to Russia. Jesuits still had the power. Why? Because they know how powerful and intelligent these Jesuits are. Frederick the Great and his successors in Protestant Prussia had a similar attitude. As a matter of fact, Frederick von Hardenberg in 1800 in the work Alias Novalis, Protestant German philosopher, who was a Protestant German philosopher, said this. Never before in the course of the world's history had such a society appear. The old Roman itself did not lay schemes for world domination with greater certainty of success. In fact, G.B. Nicolini of Rome, in his work History of the Jesuits, which is a scholar's uh, award uh, work actually, said this, Even in England, Jesuits were never so well treated, nor perhaps so prosperous as during their legal suppression. E. Boyd, uh, e. Boyd Barrett, who's an Irish-American ex-Jesuit, was quoting Jesuit Cordara in the Jesuit Enigma. Quote, the Jesuit order at last reached the pinnacle of its power and prestige in the early 18th century. It had become more influential and more wealthy than any other organization in the world. It held a position in world affairs that no oath-bound group of men has ever held before or since. Nearly all the kings and sovereigns of Europe had only Jesuits as directors of their consciences so that the whole of Europe appeared to be governed by Jesuits only. Why is it during their suppression that the Jesuits were more prosperous than during their time when in the Vatican before? Yeah. 
We shall cover that next time. Here they come. What did America's founding fathers think about this great danger? Next time, all right, to be continued. Father God, I pray that uh, tonight's teachings uh, will be a blessing to the hearers, help us to realize the importance of our history. Lord, we are a part of this great story, Lord. And the good guys are losing, Lord. I pray that we'll be the good guys who win and not fall prey to the spirit of this world of apostasy and weaken our spirits. I pray that we'll be strong even when I'm not present, Lord. Help these people remain strong and supportive of one another, Lord, and not repeat our history. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.